the Lord really wants us to understand how things are going to unfold at the end, during the end of days. The next chapters are intentionally repetitive and intentionally horrific. Jesus really wants us to understand this. God really wants his people to understand his plan. And so in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of teachings on the day of the Lord. Jesus taught extensively on the end times. Paul in the New Testament, Peter in the New Testament. This is one of the top three topics in the Bible. And so we need to have a good eschatology, a good theology of the end times. And so Jesus gives us the book of Revelation, and it is intentionally graphic. I try not to condense what the Lord has emphasized. I try not to apologize for the Lord's wrath, but rather attempt to teach it in the manner that he gave it. With this in mind, let's read Revelation chapter 6, six beginning in verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called on the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. From the great day of their, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Hmm. With the opening of the fifth seal, the scene shifts from earth to heaven, and this seal is all about the martyrs, those that have been killed because of their faith, and they're crying out, how long, O Lord, how long? And that phrase, that question that is echoing in heaven is so incredibly relevant. How long, O oh Lord, as we endure hardship, as we endure injustice, as, as we sacrifice, and as many pay the ultimate price and spill their blood upon the altar as a sacrifice to Jesus, we cry out, how long, O Lord, how long? In the Old Testament, ritual blood of a sacrificial victim was poured out at the base of the altar, and the blood was the most important part of the sacrifice. The souls of the martyrs are seen under the altar as though they had been sacrificed upon the altar and their blood poured out at its base. The Christians that had been slaughtered, the Christians that had been butchered because of their faith were crying out in heaven. And the word here for slain, the word here for slain, it could also be translated slaughtered. The souls of those who had been slain, had been slaughtered, had been butchered. It's the same word used in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. The lamb that had been slaughtered, the lamb that had been butchered, and now his followers, the followers of the lamb are being slain. They're being slaughtered. They're being butchered. Why? 
it says here that they have been slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So there are places in the world, there, there are definitely times in the history of Christianity, the original context of this book, the, the original audience were experiencing persecution from the Roman Empire, and there was wave after wave of persecution for hundreds of years. Suffering was a part of basic discipleship for Christians. Suffering was a part of Christianity 101 for Christians. And there are many Christians around the world today that as they maintain their biblical convictions, as they maintain their testimony, they are suffering and many are dying as a result of maintaining their convictions about the word of God. Jesus was slaughtered. Some of his followers will be slaughtered. And there is no fine print. There is no fine print in the Bible when it comes to the cost of discipleship. When Jesus said in Luke chapter 14 that and he gave this extensive teaching on the cost of discipleship, and Jesus would constantly remind the crowds what it meant to step out of the crowd and become a committed follower of Jesus. There's a difference between being a fan and being a follower. There's a difference in being a part of a Christian culture of Christendom and being an actual disciple of Jesus. And the difference is the cross of Christ. There's no fine print in the Bible. Jesus was very clear what it meant to follow him. In Luke chapter 14, he told them to consider the cost before making a decision. And so he didn't put salvation on discount. He didn't put salvation on clearance in order to increase the response. He did not lower the price to increase the response. He kept the bar here and said, if any person would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. And in 21st century North America, we've put salvation on clearance in order to increase the response. And this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer a part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. So Satan has been cast down to earth, and he knows that his time is short, and so he rages like a caged, like an unleashed rabid animal. He rages against the people of God. He rages against the body of Christ unleashing the hatred of hell upon the followers of Christ. John was receiving this vision as he was exiled on an island because of his faith in Jesus. John had already witnessed the murder of the other apostles. He was the only one left. All of the other apostles had been brutally murdered. He was pastoring people that were experiencing persecution. Either they had personally experienced it or they knew someone that had been persecuted, even martyred. The, in the early church, th these were the people that created the DNA of the theology of the early church. 
these the apostles that, that suffered for the sake of the gospel, that were preaching the sermons, discipling new Christians to suffer for the sake of the gospel. And so Jesus preached it and then gave the ultimate example through the crucifixion. His followers, the apostles, preached it, and then they gave the ultimate illustration of their sermon by laying down their lives for the sake of the gospel. In the early church, being a martyr wasn't theoretical or strictly theological. What we've done in 21st century North American discipleship is we've taken the cross as a metaphor for crucifying our sinful desires. And while that's true on a secondary level, it was nothing less than an instrument of execution. And so the original audience didn't see it as metaphorical but it was very real for them. The early church's theology of martyrdom was born not in classrooms and councils, but in blood-drenched coliseums. The word martyr means witness and is used as such throughout the New Testament. However, as the Roman Empire, the one world superpower, became increasingly hostile towards Christianity, towards Christianity, the distinction between witnessing and suffering became blurred and finally non-existent. The belief in the virtue of martyrdom generated the phenomenon of volunteering, whereby numbers of Christians actively sought persecution and death. So what I want us to do in hearing that brief description of how the early church viewed suffering and martyrdom, how there was, the, the, they how the how Jesus viewed it, how the apostle view, viewed it, how the church fathers viewed it, how the the early Christians viewed it, and and they saw it as an incredible privilege to suffer loss for the sake of Christ. They they saw it as an honor. They saw it as an authentication of their faith. And I want you, to, I want us to take that view and I want us to contrast it with the 21st century North American church's view of suffering and martyrdom. This early church had such a clear and present theology of suffering, so much so that the, their heroes were the martyrs. And I want us to see the absolute absence of a theology of suffering in most North American churches, and our heroes are not the martyrs, our heroes are the megachurch pastors, to say, God forgive us for fundamentally changing biblical discipleship to the point where it would be unrecognizable to the apostles. This isn't some ancient teaching that is no longer relevant. 20, the 20th century, I want you to listen closely to this. The 20th century was the age of martyrs. That's right. The 20th century is known as the age of martyrs, with more people being murdered for their faith than all previous centuries combined. And now as we enter the 21st century, Christianity is the most persecuted group on the planet. I want you to think about that. One, one article said two thirds of the 2.3 billion Christians in the world today live in dangerous neighborhoods. They are often poor. They, are, they often belong to ethnic, linguistic, and cultural minorities, and they are often at risk. There is a price they pay for following Jesus. There is a very real and present cost that comes with their decision to be a Christian. It's happening right now in many parts of the world. There are re-education camps in China right now. They are bulldozing churches. There are things happening. There are horrendous human rights violations that are happening around the world right now. And as Christians in North America, we need to have a biblical worldview 
We need to have a biblical theology, not one that is enculturated, not an enculturated Christianity, but a a biblical Christianity that provides a global perspective on our faith, that we are one small part of the universal church, all Christians that have ever lived in every age, in every place. It's happening right now. One article said that the persecution of Christians in parts of the world, this was an article that came out um, through the BBC in 2019. It's happening right now. The persecution of Christians in parts of the world is at near genocide levels, according to a report ordered by the foreign secretary in the UK. This report indicates that Christians are the most persecuted group in the world. And Christians should not be shocked. Christians should not be surprised. There was no fine print in the ministry of Jesus. There is no fine print at the back of the salvation brochure. Jesus was very clear. The apostles were very clear. The early church fathers were very clear. The church in North America needs revelation discipleship preparing followers to suffer for the sake of the gospel and even die for their faith. We are currently, based on our current blueprint of discipleship, we are preparing people to become apostates. We are discipling people to become disillusioned when the tribulation actually happens. We are training them to expect prosperity when God has told us very clearly to expect opposition, to expect suffering. And so when you see a storm coming, you can prepare. And God has given us this supernatural forecast of tribulation through his word, specifically the book of Revelation. So how should we as God's people prepare as he's given us? this prediction. When you see a storm coming, you can prepare. And so our discipleship, an essential part of our discipleship needs to include preparation for persecution. Rather than expecting prosperity, we should expect persecution. There is a growing hostility in North America towards Christianity. Unfortunately, many respond to the growing hostility with the wrong weapons. Accessing the arsenal of the world, using the weapons of worldliness to fight back and protect ourselves and our rights and our families and our culture, this Christian culture that we're willing to fight to preserve. Some even advocate forming Christian militias and stockpiling firearms and ammunition. Let me be clear. This is not the way of Jesus. It never has been, and it never will be. North America is not the biblical exception to the rule of suffering and sacrifice. Our, the, North, the, the cross that Christians in North America are called to bear is not is no different than the cross of Christians around the world today. There is no cushioned cross. There is no velvet-covered cross. There is no gold-plated cross. There's only one cross that saves, and that's the cross of Jesus. We see throughout the New Testament, but especially in the book of Revelation, that martyrs get special acknowledgement and special reward. That these martyrs are singled out, and we'll see in later chapters uh, that there's going to be a lot more martyrs, and they get there's a special reward that is associated with sacrificing your life for the sake of the gospel. Jesus is clear. He says here, as the martyrs cry out, and by the way, these martyrs are crying out for vengeance because that's the that's the what that's what's happening during the tribulation. 
God's justice, God's wrath is going to be unleashed. And so these, these martyrs are, are actually, are actually um, communicating what's in the mind of God. As the Bible says, do not repay evil for evil. You know, the Bible says that God continually reminds his people that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And, and Jesus taught this and, and gave it by an example. And so, but this is the time when God is pouring out his vengeance. This is the time where those that slaughtered the people of God, those that abused the people of God, are being held accountable. But you, we, we, say, we see here in Revelation 6 that they're told, they're given a white robe and they're told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Jesus is clear. There will be many more martyrs. And have we considered the possibility that we would be in that number? Have we considered the possibility that things could shift so radically that being a real follower of Jesus is punishable by death. As we progress through the book of Revelation, it will become abundantly clear that real Christians are going to be targeted and exterminated. So we must prepare ourselves for what the Bible says will happen. God has told us this is what it's going to look like. And the same God that was faithful to fulfill his promises throughout history will be faithful to fulfill this promise at the return of Christ. So we must prepare ourselves and we must prepare our children to maintain our convictions, even at the cost of our lives. We come to the sixth seal and this scene shifts back to earth and we see the catastrophic imagery that, is, that, that John is describing. This, um, this unimaginably catastrophic season, which would have been familiar to the students of the Old Testament. Uh, the, God, the prophet Joel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, among others. And Jesus uses similar language in Matthew 24 when Jesus is preaching his eschatology. Immediately after, the, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. One paraphrase says, cosmic powers tremble. When God grabs the plant of this temporary universe and he shakes it like, like a gardener grabbing a a plant and shaking it as the fruit falls, as the dirt, and the, as it all just begins, the, the violent shaking that it will occur at the time of the tribulation. These images were familiar to the original audience because they were discipled by the prophecies of the Old Testament. We, however, are familiar with these catastrophic images, not because we're familiar, not so much because we're familiar with the Old Testament, so much as we like to watch apocalyptic movies. John is describing a time of unprecedented earthquakes and eruptions. And the, the movies that seem to me most popular actually are attempting to articulate a biblical truth. There is something in us that knows that there is an end 
that there's going to be, there was a beginning and there's going to be a, an end. There was an introduction and there's going to be a conclusion. And so the most popular books and it seems like the most popular movies are apocalyptic in nature. That there's going to be a culmination. And you see what John is describing here, this time of simultaneous cataclysmic events where earthquakes, unprecedented earthquakes, when you watch the, uh, and, and these super volcanoes that are going to erupt. And as I studied this week about earthquakes and volcanoes and asteroids, these things are have actually happened in history. You know, the, the Yellowstone super volcano, right? That, that when it erupts, it will have apocalyptic um, damage. Asteroids that hit the planet and the dust and the smoke create an apocalyptic darkness. In July of last year, a 100 meter wide asteroid passed just 70,000 kilometers from Earth. That may seem like a lot to us, but in the world of Austro but in the world of astronomy, that is a close call. The last minute detection is yet another sign of how much remains unknown about space and a sobering reminder of the very real threat that asteroids pose. Dr. Alan Duffy, an astrophysicist, said, it should worry us all, quite frankly. It's not a Hollywood movie. It's a clear and present danger. There's a movie coming out in two weeks called Greenland about asteroids hitting the earth. And of course, there was a movie years ago that came out called Deep Impact, another one that came out that was called Armageddon. Emily Lakdawalla, senior editor of the Planetary Society, which promotes space exploration. She said of the recent near miss, it's a reminder that an important activity is to be watching the skies. These cataclysmic natural disasters will result in unimaginable destruction and chaos on a global scale. From science fiction to science fact, John is describing things that are literally possible and even likely. And how will the people of the earth respond to all of this? The, the Bible goes on to say that as these cataclysmic events happen simultaneously, as super volcanoes are erupting, as, as earthquakes shake the planet, creating tsunamis, destructive tsunamis, as asteroids fall from the sky and hit the earth, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, they hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So the... No one is exempt from the wrath of the Lamb. And the, the thing about this is they run from the Lamb in fear rather than responding to the Lamb in faith. It's the same response of Adam and Eve when they sinned. Sin called, caused them to be ashamed, and that shame drove them to run from the presence of God, to hide from the presence of God. And Jesus came as a solution to that shame, as a solution to that fear that we don't have to run from the wrath of the Lamb. We don't have to be afraid of the wrath of the Lamb. Rather, we respond in faith, by grace, through faith, in Christ. The wrath of the Lamb. What a bizarre phrase. That phrase popped off the page of the Bible, and it's lodged in my mind. It's been in the crock pot, simmering. It's been percolating. The wrath of the lamb. 
the ultimate oxymoron, not the wrath of the lion, that makes sense. Not the wrath of the majestic ram, that would make a little more sense. But what he says here is the wrath of the lamb. It's not the wrath of the, it's not just the wrath of the lamb, but that word in the, in the language of the Bible used for lamb communicates a little lamb. It communicates a, vulner, a vulnerable lamb. The, it communicates a slaughtered lamb, the wrath of the slaughtered lamb. A divine wrath that is ultimately redemptive. The slain lamb being the source makes the wrath redemptive. As we read all of this in Revelation, in the coming chapters, in the coming weeks and months, I have to ask the question, why the long drawn out process, seven years of tribulation, of increasing intensity, why, why not just snap his fingers and be done with it? Why? does God continue to send wave after wave of tribulation? The answer is grace. Grace in the midst of wrath. We're going to see radical resistance to God, unbelievably, supernaturally, demonically inspired unbelief in spite of God manifesting his presence in such obvious ways, in spite of God fulfilling prophecy in such blatant ways on a global stage. It's, Jesus came in fulfillment. Jesus came the first time in fulfillment to many Old Testament prophecies. And yet, they attacked him, and yet they tortured him, and yet they murdered him. And it was the religious crowd that attacked the fulfillment of prophecy. And the same thing will be true at his second coming. There's going to be this demonically inspired unbelief and this demonically inspired hostility towards the true followers of the Lamb. Why not just be done with it? Why the seven years of misery? Because the lamb gives every person every possible chance to repent and be saved right up until the very end. And so how I wanna conclude today is by being sure you're ready. Perhaps some of you have been running in fear from the wrath of the Lamb. And you're, you're running is fueled by your shame, the guilt, over your sin, that you know you're not worthy to approach his presence, that you know you deserve judgment because of your sin. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short, short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, we deserve death. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so rather than running away in fear, turn around and approach the lamb in faith. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
in a world that is so uncertain, a future that is so fragile. Don't wait. Respond now and have that security in knowing that regardless of what happens in this world, regardless of what storms come our way, regardless of what happens in the political world, in the economic world, that our soul is secure in the grip of God. That no matter what, no matter what, Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and how shocking it is. Thank you for those that have provided an example of what it means, Lord, to take up our cross. Thank you, Lord, for those around the world that, God, the heroes of our faith that are unheralded here on earth, that are right now enduring persecution, that are right now shedding their blood for the sake of the gospel refusing to compromise their convictions, to give up their testimony. Help us not to only be inspired by their example, but Lord, to, to be willing to go there ourselves. With the increasing hostility around us here in North America, help us, Lord, to look to your word to shape our expectations and our convictions. And in doing so, prepare for what is to come. To prepare ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. To not, to not take up arms and fight back, but to follow in your footsteps, Jesus down the, the Via Della Rosa, to follow in the footsteps of the apostles, to follow in the footsteps of the early church and in the footsteps of countless thousands throughout Christian history that have willingly and even joyfully laid down their life for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen.